This is I Love Black People Radio on HUR Voices, Sirius XM, Channel 141. I Love Black People is more than a radio show. I Love Black People is a call from our ancestors to protect us from racial profiling all across the world. Go to iloveblackpeople.com and become a member today. Membership empowers you to live fearlessly and protect black people globally from racism and xenophobia. Join us today and become a member of our global network with an online global friendly businesses to protect you and your community. Membership is free and with you, we will become 10 million strong worldwide. I am because we are. And welcome to another edition of I Love Black People. And we've been blessed today to have an amazing brother of mine who's been doing the good people's work now for decades. I, you know, I met him and we were both at a younger age. And now we're at an older age, and this brother's been putting together a body of work for our people that's amazing. I have our brother, our good brother, Brother Drew Hubbard. Welcome to I Love Black People. And thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule in, in the DHCD, Department of Housing and Community Development, in the, this, the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Welcome, welcome, Drew. Tell our audience who you are, and let's get this going. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Brother Skinner. Uh, as you said, I'm Drew Hubbard. I had the privilege of serving as the interim director of the D.C. Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, but since 2005, I've been with the district government in various capacities. I, I, I worked for several years for one of our other good brothers, uh, former council member Kwame Brown, on his first legislative staff, and have always been focused on issues related to uh, low and moderate income residents of the district. So I've done workforce development policy, housing policy, returning citizens policy, um, and it all kind of uh, has circled back to now running this agency that is laser focused on funding and building affordable housing for our, our residents here to make sure they have safe and affordable places to live in the District of Columbia. All right, well, give, give us the, the early story. You know, how did you get here? I, you know, I know I made a, a joke a couple of weeks back about somebody winning a, a, a football game. You know, give, give us some of the, like, how did you get here? When, you know, talk about some of those early stories because we, we have an audience oftentimes, you know, wants to kind of follow the footsteps. So how did we get here, Brother Drew? Absolutely. And I'm, I'm just I'm just a, a humble guy from Pennsylvania. Um, grew up the son of a school nurse and a high school teacher and football and baseball coach um, in the Philadelphia school system. Uh, but going way back, my family have been Tuskegee on my mother's side and Morehouse on my father's side. And I, I made that decision to, to follow in my brother's footsteps and my grandfather's footsteps to go to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, which was transformative. Um, you know, just going there around all that black excellence uh, the people I met day one of undergrad are some of the guys I still hang with and even do business with today. Um, and, and even, you know, my, my roommate through most of those years is a crazy guy from Boston. And we talked about going to law school and we both ended up doing that. I came to D.C., uh, ended up going to GW for law school. Um, and that's when I got into the local political scene here and really just fell into what comes to me naturally. I've always uh, really believed in public service, believed in, in, in doing things to help advance the lot of, of Black people, Black institutions, um, member of the ultimate fraternity, Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. I'm also, yeah, uh, baby, yo, of, go ahead. Yeah, also a Prince Hall Mason made right here in D.C. Um, and it's all interconnected. It's all interconnected with those groups that, that, that people look at as, as long been in being the pillars of, of the community and helping uh, their fellow man out. So I do it in kind of a, a, a social and, and outside hat, but also as, as my day-to-day -day work with really helping DC residents. Um, and one of, one of the, the pivotal people kind of in, in my training early on in my career, I worked for Marion Barry. Um, and those of you who actually know Marion Barry know what he meant to the District of Columbia and what he still means, his legacy means to people who gave, oh, yeah. gave their first job to. Um, the institution of the DC government really and truly kind of was invented by him. You know, pre him, uh, a lot of people don't know, DC's uh, home rule is only, you know, uh, just about 40 years old. Um, he, he basically invented 
home rule here in the District of Columbia, local government here, a lot of the institutions and, and agencies and programs and thoughts that really helped make the black middle class, not just in DC, but in this region came out of his head. And I was, I was uh, really fortunate to learn at his feet for, for many years. Awesome. So look, so that's the backdrop, which is amazing. So let's talk about the, the hottest and, and the biggest things that you're working on and the things that, you know, keep you motivated uh, and leading the way across the country. What Absolutely. Are some of those things? Well, you know, we, we as the district, uh, the joke is they don't make any more land in D.C., right? So we have to be very innovative of, of how we use our land, um, how, we, how we use it to, to make sure that there's housing, enough housing for everyone. Um, you know, one of, one of the, the things people don't realize, a lot of the land in D.C. is under the control of the federal government. So there's on, only so much that we control. So we have many, many nation leading uh, affordable housing tools. Our Housing Reduction Trust Fund um, really leads the nation as far as production of affordable housing. And, and our mayor uh, pledged when she first came into office that she was going to put at least $100 million of new money into the trust fund for production every year. Uh, she has met that that promise and actually increased it. Uh, this past fiscal year that just ended, uh, there was over four hundred and fifty million dollars in the trust fund. The new fiscal year that started on Saturday, I have another four hundred and forty million dollars just to do affordable housing projects for the residents here. So it's things like that. Um, just today, uh, we actually released the report on the Black Homeownership Strike Force, and the main focus of that strike force is to look at increasing the number of black homeowners in the district. And the goal for 2030 is adding 20,000 new black homeowners in the District of Columbia and putting the resources and programs behind it so folks can do that. Okay, so yeah, you said her. So you referring to the mayor, uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser, how, what, what role does she have with these things that you're talking about as far as tools? Well, she sets the vision, um, but you know, to her credit, she's put people in place that she trusts to go and operationalize them. So. You know, she sets the bigger goals. You know, right now we have a nation leading uh, goal of increasing the number of homes in the district by 36,000 by 2025, 12,000 of which to be affordable. Uh, she was the first uh, mayor, first leader of a jurisdiction to put targeted goals in place. So not only are we going to build those units, uh, we've created neighborhood specific goals in places like Ward 3 and other uh, high amenity neighborhoods that, you know, I haven't had a lot of affordable housing development in the past, knowing that we want everyone to have options all across the district. If they want to live uptown, if they want to live in Ward 3 or downtown or, you know, in upper, upper Ward 4, places where traditionally you've had, you know, only high income individuals. We want to give people the opportunity to live wherever they want to in the city. And we're going to help build the housing all around the city to make that happen. Okay, well, let's, you know, delve in a little deeper on the, the context of how, what your role is in that. It, you know, the big 30,000 feet, that was huge with uh, Muriel Bowser, the mayor. But now, you know, take us down into the day in the life of Brother Drew Hubbard. Like, what does that look like? So I, I lead a, an agency of about uh, 180 people, and we are charged with uh, some regulatory things, including our rent control law, inclusion and zoning, but the main engine of this agency is the funding of affordable housing projects. So development partners, whether they're for-profit, non-profit, mission-based, come to us during our request for proposals and uh, propose affordable housing projects uh, for funding. And we are a gap funder. So what that means is they're coming to us for that last bit of capital, that last bit of funding to get their projects to pencil out and get across the finish line so they can get built. Um, and we do it bigger than anybody else in the country. Uh, like I said, the, the amount of local resources that we have um, per capita far outstrip any city or other jurisdiction in the country. Uh, most other jurisdictions rely more heavily on, on federal affordable housing funding. We layer it all together. So we have our federal funds uh, from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, but our local funds far outstrip that. And we, we literally just funded another thousand units this year of affordable housing. Now, when you say that, so in in comparison to other places, when you're doing gap funding, these these projects you're working on, can you give us some examples of these projects or is anything coming to mind that you think might have been uh, not possible, but for the work that you're doing in affordable housing and kind of give a, or something that's already been done, but it was it was instrumental, the work that's being done from the government? 
Absolutely. And, and, and I'll say it, I'll start by saying this, we are the cabinet level agency in the government, but we have two sister agencies are, are the DCHA, which is the housing authority, which is uh, quasi independent and our housing finance agency, which is similarly quasi independent, but we work very closely together and co-fund a lot of projects. Uh, the, the specific project that comes to mind, um, you know, years ago, you had a program that at the federal level called Hope Six, which I'm sure you are well aware of, uh, where the goal of, of it was to, to redevelop um, many of the public housing sites around the country. Well, as, as the federal government over the years has, has really shied away from, from investing uh, or reinvesting in public housing, the district stepped up um, over the past couple of administrations and created a similar program called uh, the New Communities uh, Initiative. Um, and just last week, uh, we did a groundbreaking at Barry Farms, which is one of the historic um, housing developments in Southeast Washington. Um, and this is gonna be the first building to redevelop that site. Um, the first building is a senior building, which we have partially funded um, again with our sister agencies, but you know, we're gonna create literally a thousand units of affordable housing on that site um, that is sorely needed and long overdue to make sure that you know, residents in the neighborhood have safe options to go to and live in. So if it wasn't for, I mean, if, the, if you're, agency wasn't involved what would what would these residents have to do or what would developers you know let's look at it like that if, you, if it wasn't for drew you and your team of folks and i love how you you're spreading the, the love around so you're not like you know some <laughs> folks down here and said they did everything themselves but I, I definitely i'm picking up what you're putting down with the team effort you know without the work you're doing you know what is what is that what does that world look like and frankly, you know, these deals wouldn't get done. Um, so again, just taking, taking the, the amount of resources we, we had, which was groundbreaking in itself to what we have now. And you know, we would have to pick and choose uh, between what would otherwise be uh, shovel ready or, or, or very promising projects um, just on the limitations on resources. Um, again, I helped push for adding, you know, more money to that pot and, I, and for the first time, we were able to fund every project that came before us um, in, in our first round of RFP this year. Um, but what that really means is, you know, otherwise you're looking at, at things like the acceleration of gentrification, um, you know, housing that may have traditionally been affordable going market rate or luxury, you know, without the money that we put down and without the decisions that I make to fund these projects. So it, I take it very seriously, stewarding this money to make sure that, again, we can stem the tide of people being, being displaced out of D.C., um, many long-term residents, many native Washingtonians that otherwise, you know, would be somewhere else because they, they weren't able to, to, to find an affordable place to live right here in the place where they were born. So is that, I mean, when you look at what, what you do every day to address the issue of gentrification, the, the task force that I thought was pretty interesting. Can you tell us more about some of the work you're doing with the Black, what, what's the name of the task force? It's the Black Homeownership Task Force. Um, I mean, I think and... that's Black Homeownership Task Force. Like that right there just seems very like clearly, is there anyone else have a Black uh, uh, no. Ownership Task Force? I mean, any capital or major metropolitan? No, nowhere else that we've seen that is doing it. And, and again, the charge was, was from the mayor to the folks that she put on the panel um, to come up with a specific goal to increase black homeowners in DC and come up with some of the tools and recommendations to do it. Uh, what goes along with that was there was $10 million put into the current budget as, as really seed money to start this activity. Uh, one of the recommendations I made, which I'm happy was was, uh, was adopted was to take that $10 million and actually leverage it into a larger fund. Uh, we've been able to do that in, in other areas where we've gotten, at least in, in, in our current uh, preservation fund, a three to one match. So we, we seeded a fund and we're able to get outside money. Uh, so we've created another $100 million fund. And I think that's where we're going with this. Uh, really looking at some serious money uh, when it comes to both the production of new homes that will be available for black folks to buy, as well as other things. Um, you know, one of the, the things that we ran into and saw, uh, which we already knew, but we really got more data on, uh, was also preservation of current black homeowners. 
Um, and one of the, the pitfalls to that is, is passing property along to that next generation. So you may have grandma or big mama who, who regrettably passes away and then the children are there and they don't have clear title or they have back taxes and then they end up selling the house off instead of keeping it in the family. So we have a million dollars that we're about to put on the street to help with uh, both legal work to clear title for those homes, to help with back taxes and other things to make sure those homes stay in black families. Oh, wow. Okay. So what else did you, I mean, you, you, you named a couple. Was there any other findings from this uh, black home ownership task force? Was strike well, we, force? Was we, it strike force, right? Strike okay, force, strike force. It was strike. I mean, that, woo, man, that sounds aggressive. Action, so, action words. Yeah. Action, action words. So what else and did we, uh, you we were reminded of, of just the sad history of redlining and all the discriminatory policies that have kept black folks from being able to be homeowners, whether it was not being able to access the GI Bill after World War II um, and things that were, were perpetuated um, that even in a city that at its height was as black as it was, Chocolate City, right? And there were still Chocolate those things that, yeah, they, they kept the wealth gap and the divide where it is. And that, and, and if you look at, where most of you know white Americans either are able to gain wealth or keep wealth, it's through homes, um, being able to send their kids to college through taking money out of their homes, uh, pulling money out to start a business. You know that 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 generational wealth at its base really starts with home ownership, and that's what we we're focused on. So it, it's that uh, there's some other policy aims that we're looking at, including uh, looking at how to disincentivize. Uh, investors coming in and snatching up properties so that you know the regular working class person is not able to really compete with a, you know a cash investor to buy a home um, again the 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 fund to actually produce units and build units uh, to put repair money into existing units um, and again it, it it's a it's a wraparound um, look at this thing and you know one of the things that we have in the district is a website called uh, frontdoordc.gov and what we've tried to do with that is put all the resources, both for prospective homeowners and current homeowners in one place. And it actually asks you to take a quiz to determine what we have that can help you out. And we're trying to build to that toolbox every day to, to be as aggressive as we can, especially to increase the black homeownership rate. All right. So, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, those are pretty compelling. What about like you, you're talking about the redlining and the financing, or is there anything being done about those racist discriminatory uh, processes that have been targeted sp specifically at Black Americans and, as African Americans. Is there anything about that that we're looking at? So one of the one of the things with the strike force, we had a broad cross section of people, even you know folks from the bank industry, from realtors. Um, we we whether it was government finance, uh, folks who are realtors historically have been part of the, the, the problem over the decades that affected black people. So having those people reform what they do um, and really get towards not just equality, but equity in this space. So, you know, I don't have to tell you, you know, equality means equal. That means I'm gonna give everyone a fair share. But if, if we're starting on first base and everybody else on third, I need a little bit more. So we need to do more for the people that have been historically discriminated against. One other change that went into effect, we have a first time home buyers program uh, called HPAP that as it is right now was one of the, if not the most generous uh, programs that help with closing costs and down payment assistance. So up until Saturday, the old program would give up to $80,000 in down payment and closing cost assistance. Beginning with this new fiscal year, we've bumped that up to the upper limit now is uh, a person seeking to buy a home in DC can get up to $202,000 in down payment and closing cost assistance wow. from the district government to help buy that house. Wow. And I mean, no, one, no, one in, no one in the country is anywhere near that. They weren't anywhere near our, our other limits, but we just know what the need is. And I think that's the, the cost of living is so high in DC. So those are those a part of the, I know we talk about these indexes affordable. I mean, let's, Let's break those down. If you can, I'm not trying to put you on the math quiz, but what is affordable? Like we just said, what's affordable these days in the district, just compared to other places? Well, I, I always like to break it down this way. There's a difference between affordable housing and housing affordability. Um, and I'll start with housing affordability first. 
everyone, no matter what your income level is, has concerns about whether their home or apartment or, or condo is affordable to them. So that's housing affordability. Uh, affordable housing has set definitions based on whether it's you know federally funded or if it's a local program. And that's usually set by the area median income or the median family income. Uh, the one trick about DC is that is a regional measure. So not only are you looking at what people on average make in the District of Columbia, you got to factor in what people make in Loudoun County, in Fairfax, in Montgomery County. These We have some of the richest counties that surround us and excuse our, our average median income way up. Um, and that's where you get some of the confusion and, and, and rightly so about what people, uh, whether they consider things affordable or not. So typically when we do affordable housing, it's anything um, kind of along a scale that is set aside for folks making either at 80% of that median income and below. Um, we have a, a focus with our local funds on the range from 0% to 30% and 31% to 50. Um, so most of our funding, about 90% of it goes to folks making half of the median income and below. Oh, that's that's good to know, because I think, again, I, that's one of the, the pushbacks of, you know, what does it mean? What is affordable? And I think that's a good, you know, a rule of thumb for folks to, to understand. What do you see in the future? I mean, I think as we come to the close, I, I want to make sure, you know, some of the things that you're talking about being done now, we talk about uh, Barry Forms, a historically uh, affordable housing project. What what do you see in the future uh, as far as how we will be living and what we see is uh, affordability and in, in home in, in beyond today. Well, I have two major goals I want to accomplish while in this seat. Um, one I've already talked about is creating units where they haven't been. And if you know DC and kind of the different neighborhoods in DC, Ward, Ward 3 is one of the most affluent parts of the city. Um, I'm happy that we got our first project that we funded in Ward 3 this year. I want to keep that going. I want to build many, many more units in, in those affluent or amenity-rich neighborhoods, as, as we like to say, again, just to give that, that option for people to have anywhere in the city. Um, on, the, on the flip side, but just as important, in our, our underserved areas of the city that have typically been east of the river that have uh, not been invested in uh, adequately for decades, um, I want to make sure we put more market rate units over here and more amenities over here, along with the affordable housing we have built and will continue to build so that we're able to, to create more of a mixed income environment um, so you can have the different restaurants, stores, amenities come to those neighborhoods so folks don't have to travel either out of the district to go shop or across town just to get basic supplies. Uh, so I think it goes hand in hand, making sure that the options go both ways. And what about the folks building? You know, I, you know, I've been involved on the building side, development side. What, what about the capacity of black developers, black uh, GCs, construction folks in the district? Uh, how would you compare that with other places? And what, how do you see your role in increasing, or or do you see a role as it relates to that? Yeah, I absolutely have a role. Um, I was at a dinner with our good fraternity brother, Omar Kareem, the other day, and we were just talking right. about this. Um, uh, our, our agency reports up through the deputy mayor for planning and economic development. And one thing that they have done over the past few years is release what they call an equity RFP, where only folks, developers, the development team of color have the opportunity to bid on those. Uh, we're gonna follow in that vein. Uh, I've already drafted or had staff draft our own equity RFP. So some of these uh, uh, pieces of land that we acquire uh, for redevelopment, some of these other projects that we control, I want to look at really empowering our rich uh, pool of, of minority developers here to get a piece of this pie and a big piece of it. Um, and I, I think that's that's part of our mission because the other part of the Department of Housing and Community Development is community development. And to me, that's part of community development, is making sure that our local businesses, especially our, our disadvantaged businesses, historically uh, owned by historically disadvantaged populations, really get a chance to play in, in these resources and in the redevelopment of their own communities. Um, I've had the privilege of running the apprenticeship office here in the city. 
um, registered apprenticeship is an excellent way to get into a high paying career path. So education, however you better yourself and skill up, whether it's a four year degree, whether it's an associate's degree or whether it's registered apprenticeship, you've got to better yourself to make sure that you can unlock your potential to make sure as a race that we are able to get back to where uh, we should be. Um, and make sure we have those examples to show to the generations coming behind us that, you know, we can strive to to be, uh, you know, uh, not just a part of the fabric of America, but leaders in America. Right on, right on, right on, Brother Hubbard. Woo! Hey, you, you finished this trough. I appreciate that. Humbly, humbly. And so, as I always leave us, I am because we are, and I definitely wouldn't be me without my dear, wonderful Brother Hubbard. Hey, look. But you just crushed it on that last one. There's nothing for me to say. So thank you so much, Brother Drew, for being in here with us. And thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is I Love Black People Radio on HUR Voices, Sirius XM, Channel 141. I Love Black People is more than a radio show. I Love Black People is a call from our ancestors to protect us from racial profiling all across the world. Go to iloveblackpeople.com and become a member today. Membership empowers you to live fearlessly and protect black people globally from racism and xenophobia. Join us today and become a member of our global network with an online global green book with black-owned and black-friendly businesses to protect you and your community. Membership is free and with you, we will become 10 million strong worldwide. I am because we